Yeah, just give me the go. Recording and action. All right. Well, thank thank you all for joining in this webinar on for, on Forecast Builder. This is kind of just a a one week kickoff. Uh, maybe I wanted to call it a pep rally, if you will. Uh, just uh, get us ready for what's going to be happening here as we head into the the rest of the fall and into the winter months. Again, the the Forecast Builder here. Uh, it's it's another name for it. Be a standard standard grid methodology. And my name, Andrew, just uh, one of the team members of the Central Region Grid Methodology Advisory Team. And again, this standard grid methodology was approved by the uh, RLC back in uh, back in late June. So why are we going to Forecast Builder? Well, the big idea here is to imp improve grid consistency through sound science and. As you've seen here uh, lately with the with the training package that's been released, uh, we're trying to show all the all the science that's in place with Forecast Builder, the process that's in in place to make sure that as you go from step one to two and three, that you're building the forecast, applying the science in that um, along the way. So uh, as forecasters. ITOs, if you've been going through the training, if you've been excited excited with what you've seen with Forecast Builder, even maybe playing around with it, great. Um, but you know, there may I'm sure there are some too that are not excited, uh, and that's okay. I mean, for GFE purposes, we've never had a structured approach to developing the forecast um, in the well, 15 years or so since GFE has been around, and and uh, so everybody's developed routines. They, you know, some as as noted in the initial in our proposals, like some of these routines may have found science to them, others may not. So we're just trying to get everybody onto the onto the same page. Something that you know was probably needing delivery a long time long time ago. Uh, so yeah. So why are we changing to this? Well, the big thing here is to ha having the standard grid prepara preparation process will help improve both collaboration and consistency across central region. Additionally, we'll have that common starting point applied, which used to be at day at day four. Where, um, you had the option, of course, going a little bit earlier than that, but now we're going to be uh, begin that at period two. Which will help fill that gap that we've had between the ESTF and extended. It'll improve consistency since we'll have a starting point that's already consistent. Any deviation from that can produce inconsistency, but we have that starting point that is consistent. And then allow us to focus our time on the near term uh, IDSS and, and other services and knowledge, you know, that, that only we at our local offices. Um, can provide, uh, as well as any you know significant um, events that you may see uh, all further in the forecast within the within the starting point period. There. Additionally, here is to help improve our critical snow amount and ice accumulation forecast. As we show, showed in the introduction back in late July, um, there is definite improvement needed here for both forecasts, and these are again critical to our users. And these forecasts are coming out of various tools and methodologies. So having this common standard preparation process to get to snow and ice will greatly help. And we'll be using strong science such as the FRAM and develop an ice accumulation. We'll also help to consolidate procedures in GFE. As you know, there are lots and lots of procedures in GFE. Some of our menus are getting pretty long throughout offices between our populate and consistency. So it's like, what what procedure is supposed to you know when to run it, when when where for what use? It could just get really complex. And if you're tired on midnight shifts or you know even for a new person starting off, it's a lot to lot to remember. Uh, in fact, it was one of the failures, if I will call it that, to the, my, the probability weather type methodology of, of mine that I would, you had to remember all that stuff and you get screwed up and get messed up. So uh, this will greatly help in that regard. Uh, 
also service backup. You know, one of the things you'd have to do is have every, you know, you might have some tools, but maybe your backup office doesn't. Now everybody will have the same technology provided by the forecast builder and its, and its backbone requirements. And additionally, if you have a forecaster that has to, that's moving to another office, they don't have to relearn a new approach when they get there. Uh, and that's, I think, just, just great, good big time savings for their, for their purposes. So. so why should you be excited? Well, for one, you remain the driver of the forecast and the message that that forecast conveys. We're not, we're not saying that you're going to be taken out on going on autopilot. You're still that driver of the forecast. We're providing you a common starting point, but that's not an end point. Best practices developed by you will, will impact the continued development of the MPM and its future rollout. Uh, some of this is being seen already. In fact, I'll get to my next bullet point, is that we're already impacting the MPM through the year innovation. We've been, um, the grid, some of the grid methodology team has been in collaboration with a, the team working on the MBM for, for uh, things like snow mount ice accumulation and weather, and we're already involved in that process. So uh, it's nice to see we're getting this deep feedback uh, two, you know, two way going through the process. So this, this phase three that we're in here, uh, or coming up, I should say, next week, this, as far as the implementation goes, there's a couple points to make here. The first is we, as you'll see at 530Z and 1730Z, this is region wide. We're no longer going to have that scene that we would do in daylight time where the eastern offices would initialize at one time and the rest of the region would initialize at the other. That's gone. Um, we're all going at 530Z and 1730Z with what the super blend has. And that's going to go period two through day seven. Then the test bed offices, which extend from well, Springfield up into the Great Lakes, uh, will are going to evaluate the full version of Forecast Builder, in which the full version uh, requirement is to have the t uh, some of the top-down knowledge because the top-down step is uh, part of the full version, and the full use of the pulp methodology in the Forecast Builder, which is again was the back backbone uh, to produce the weather grids. And finally, and very important here is that all sites are going to produce ice and snow mounts through Forecast Builder. And to do that, you're working with these foundation grids that you're going to be collaborating, like snow ratio, temperature, and or QPF um, for making changes to them, maybe to get your forecast to snow amount ice accumulation to what you think it should be for the event. So where are we heading? Uh, with Forecast Builder, uh, obviously here, here, October 4th is our start date for phase three, uh, including the test beds. And then as we approach the spring here uh, in, a in April, the grid methodology team will evaluate how the test beds went, make adjustments. I mean, I would say between October 4th and April, we could be seeing some adjustments um, already through there, might be technical wise, from feedback, et cetera. Uh, so don't think like there might be going on between October 4th and April. April. There'll probably be some adjustments take, taking place. Uh, bigger, more significant changes will probably happen after, after April. And then come September, uh, pending a new RLC agreement, we'll get all central region on the some form probably of the full, full forecast builder and bring in some other aspects like aviation and fire weather as well. One thing that we have to acknowledge is that the, the first month or two, you know, going through November could be a bit bumpy. Uh, you know, it's a new piece of software, you know, forecasters are going through training, um, adjusting to the way Forecast Builder works. Again, we've all developed routines and trying to readjust to a new routine. So again, I think it might take a little time, a little figuring out. Uh, there may be a few technical issues as we get get through the next couple of months. Again, it's new new software. We'll see, you know. And but us on the on the grid methodology team, including the forecast builder sub team, if you will, 
will be very responsive um, to any issues that that come up. Um, be it, you know, I maybe it's maybe it's not an issue. Maybe you have a new idea uh, how to make it better. We're open to that as well. And that brings me perfectly to this next slide: is that if you need help, um, you run into a bug. Uh, again, you have a great idea. You know, the way that the, we have the forecast builder GUI set up may not be the way it looks like next year. Um, if if all of Central Region is doing it, you know, keep that open. And, you know, all everybody think of ideas. You know, the the only call it requirement is that idea of snow, ice, and weather are derived elements, and so you know these these elements have hooks, if you will, with them, which is why the forecast builder is built the way it is. Is that you know to get snow and ice, you need to have elements like temperature, QPF, snow ratio. Um, and then those environmental grids like the max weppo block, you have to have those have those available to and then go downstream to produce your snow, ice, and weather. So uh yeah, if you have a new idea, pass that along. We've got multiple ways to pass that information along. Either the feedback form, which the test bed, test bed sites will be required to fill out, but you can go to our V Labs uh, V Lab site, the address posted there. Uh you can email our the, the group, the nws.forecastbuilder. Uh, you know, nws.forecastbuilder at noaa.gov, and you'll be in direct co contact with the developers. I know we've been in contact with uh, quite a few people already, figuring out maybe issues here and there. Um, so yeah, just just let us know. And I think this is a perfect segue of what not to do. Um, please. Do not do any local modifications to Forecast Builder. Why? A couple reasons. First, they will be overwritten in later installs. Secondly, your modifications may be needed for other offices as well. Uh, you know, some, and there have been requests, and I've been getting them into Forecast Builder to, that that apply to that apply to groups of offices. So yes. If you have some, if you have an idea that you want to have a modification, send it along again through one of those various avenues: the feedback form, the VLab site, email. Any of those three will work. And I think this is a good time to talk about the install process too, with regards for the uh, ITOs, GFE vocals running through the installs. The way the Forecast Builder install process is, has been developed, it's supposed to go quick for you guys. Um, to do this. We're look, let, looking at maybe 10 to 15 minutes at most to just run through and do an update. Uh, note that as we go through the uh, through these next several months, uh, testbed offices can expect to see more frequent updates. Uh, very similar, I think, like what we went through with the days four through seven back in uh, 2011. Uh, where you know testbed offices were doing maybe a, uh, maybe an update of, or maybe two a month as issues were were resolved. Again, installs are quick, 10 to 15 at most, maybe even five. Um, that's all it's going to take. And with that note, um, based on some feedback that we've received, um, there's a tech order that we've uh, writ written up here should be going into. Um, Maybe into emers later later today for uh, ITOs GFE vocals to in install uh, and have al already been tested about 20% of the region at this time. So. All right, so what's going to happen here on October 4th? And the day shift cron, not the mid shift, the day shift cron will populate and then save period two through day seven with super blend. As the common starting point database, not again, it's starting point, not the endpoint. Forecasters can can change that; they don't have to go on autopilot mode. Uh, using then using the forecast builder GUI, starting with the foundation grids, then march through the forecast, inspect for targets of opportunity. You know, look for those. Maybe you got a significant storm system coming up. Boom! There's there's one for you if you've got. Um, Fire weather situation that you, that you see deeper mix in. Maybe you see uh, maybe there's model snowpack issues as you get into the winter that 
the snowpack's not lining up so your highs are getting warmer than expected. Um, there's a variety, variety of different <clears throat> that could be a target of opportunity. <clears throat> Excuse me, sorry. Some specific notes here. All offices will be creating snow ratio. Again, this will be new for some. Uh, as far as what's in snow ratio for the super blend, it's 80% uh, consensus all and 20% of the pre previous forecast. And further deep, deep down, the cons all is using a variety of, of different approaches, such as the Cobb method, which is employed in the NAM, GFS, and RAP. There's thickness applied for some of the other models that don't have as deep enough vertical resolution, such as the European. And again, all that gets blended blended together. And then again, you have the previous at a 20%. Note that the National Smartnet team is performing a science review on snow ratios. So um, some of the Smartnets that go into uh, the models there for GFE, uh, for the NAM GFS, those approaches in developing snow ratio may change as, as we go to the winter and you'll everybody will be alerted to what that change is. And again, use forecast builder to create your snow and ice. If you don't like the output for the snow and ice, it's probably change something in that um, in that foundation grid step or for the offices using the full version, go to the you know go into the top down grid. And about the offices using the full version, uh, we'll, we'll also want to go through and adjust top-down grids, populate non-precipitation types, you know, as needed, and then update the weather grids. So a forecast builder has interest beyond central region as well. Uh, even though, you know, this is not just not turn into a central region project, there's m more going on beyond. We've got a couple offices that may soon start, which includes like Great Falls and Charleston, and then you go into other offices in southern region, eastern region, they've expressed interest as well, so they may be coming on board at some point too after October 4th, may wait and see how, how things evolve over the first month or so um, here in central region, get kind of an idea. But a lot of them like that idea of the process that's going on behind forecast builder, the vision, if you will. Uh, so. To, to summarize and edit our forecast, let's build it. That's all I have. Open for questions. Or any, and actually, first I should ask uh, with uh, some other, the forecast builder group on here, uh, Chuck Greif, uh, anything else you want to add, or Jerry? No, I think you did a great job there, Andy. Okay, we yeah, do have one. Wait question. for questions. Uh, yes, we do have a question from uh, Jim Sivaking in St. Louis. Go ahead, Jim. Are you there, Jim? Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, sure can. Go ahead. Okay. All right. It helps if I unmute the phone. Um, so um, what I, I was wondering is, if, is there a good way to practice some of these, uh, maybe on a winter weather event, um, I know the Westbridge doesn't allow us to uh, use GFE, but I'm wondering if, if there's some other uh, clever way. I had heard, I think Mike told me that Dan was going to do some kind of clever backup mode um, to to kind of simulate a winter weather event and have the forecasters work with the, uh, the um, top-down grids. Um, is there anything, um, you know, kind of set in stone on how, how to do that? Yep, Jim. In fact, you, you are correct. We've got... Um uh, coming up with this tech order, I've got another update to a program that will allow for this pseudo west capability, if you <laughs> want to call it that. Um, and uh, Dan is working up some simulated, uh, some kind of like simulated cases. I think he got one uh, yesterday. So uh, you should be seeing some emails, uh, I would think, pretty soon for um, for this. Uh, I've got the yeah, got the program ready to, yeah, you're going to be doing it. You'll call up a service backup uh, for for ARX, and then um, we'll have, like, a, a script that you run. Um, should be something that you could probably plop in your AWIP startup menu and have, like, scripts that or uh, items that link to various different <laughs> West-type files, if you will, <laughs> and run it. So, yeah, you'll be able to practice it. 
That sounds excellent. I appreciate you guys doing that because it's uh, nothing like uh, doing some hands-on experience to uh, kind of put it into people's minds so that when we eventually get winter weather, um, then, then then they can recall it. So appreciate that. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you, Jim, for your question. And now we'll go to uh, Matt Bunkers. Uh, Matt, uh, go ahead. Yeah, this is Matt and John here in Rapid City. Um, I have a question about the menu. There's a forecast builder and forecast builder underscore cron. And we'd like to just test it today, just play with the GUI and go through it a few times. Uh, what's the difference between the two and which one should we be using? Um, the forecast builder cron, um, it, you, um, that, that's run um, as it's in its name. It's run off the cron. So you wouldn't be, uh, you'll just use forecast, just use the forecast builder. That forecast builder cron, I think, is there just, I would say, just in case the, the cron fails or right now, at least in, in backup backup mode, may hopefully over the may over the course of the winter here, I can get a get a script here that will run and you know and check check for if you're in backup mode, and if so, we'll run the run the cron that we can get it out of that menu and get the confusion out of there. <laughs> okay, I just wondered would it be okay if we hid that from the menu now, or should we leave it accessible? Um, yeah, you could. Um, Maybe just maybe just leave it there in the event that it, yeah in the event there's a failure. Um, okay, so if for, it fails on the cron, then we could run this this one manually, and that would basically re replicate what the cron would do. Yep. Okay. Thanks. Hopefully these okay. hopefully these P, the PX re, the the PX replacements uh, that you know, the mod note just came out yesterday. Hopefully that will. That will help because uh, we had that period there uh, when we had some some offices experiencing failures, um, and then we'll be able to hide that. Okay, now uh, thanks, Matt, for the question. And uh, Brett McDonald in Riverton has a question. Let's see if I can get him unmuted. Okay, seems like I'm unable to. Um, Brett, if you're listening, you'll have to enter your audio pin. That should have popped up on your screen there. Well, anyway, I can read into you, though. Um, uh, he says 0530Z and 1730Z seem rather late in the forecast process <clears throat> for the shifts to be working on day two to day three night. Any chance of moving the time up? I usually have this time of the forecast done by 1600Z. Uh, I was gonna say we've at we have it set at that time to get you know as you know the t the twelve Z guidance because it's we're we're trying to capture day four through seven in this as well uh, yeah so we're trying to get as much model guidance we are missing uh, the twelve Z MOS guide because uh, it comes in like on the day shift <laughs> for that seventeen thirty it comes in just a smidge late for the days four through seven process we'll have it for days for the period two through day three section. So I don't think that, um, I, don't, I don't know about uh, Chuck or Jerry, you want to you wanna help a little bit on this too? Um, you know, Jerry can just talk more on the data side of this too. Yeah, I mean, as Andy said, this, this is, sorry, I'm getting an echo here, just one second. Um, the timing was something that we really spent a lot of time looking at and it's really going to be hard to narrow it down because we have to run things and um, at certain times in order to grab all of the available information. So we're trying to give people the most updated data set available to us at that point. And if we go any earlier, we're going to start cutting out things that we really would like to have in the forecast. So it's going to be really tough to try to get that to go any sooner. Um, you know, I mean, there's the other people are wanting it to actually go later in the period, so that includes the European. But, you know, this is one of those things where 1730 is what we've looked at as being pretty much the most optimal time to do this population for the period and time range that we're looking at. Yeah, I'll chime in too. We've had questions about uh, how people should do their TAF process, like particularly as we move into the age of uh, uh, doing digital aviation uh, uh, services as well. So um, one of the things that, that we've uh, looked at and, and basically are suggesting at this point is 
to work on your task, work on that part of the forecast as you would need for the task grid. So that, that does go into uh, period two. Um, go ahead and make those changes, have those available to do your, your, your aviation stuff. And then um, just understand that it will, uh, the crime will run and wipe out that first, uh, th that first part of uh, period two and the last part of your, your task period there. And um, just look over that, make sure it's not changing things too much. And if, if you're not entirely pleased with what got put in there and you, you think it's a little too uh, difficult to make the changes um, to get that back to what you had, you do have as a last resort the, the, uh, the, the public case the published grids are available to, to load back from official if, if you need to. So um, there is that uh, that way of dealing with it. And I think this is just something we're going to have to work through and see how it goes with the, uh, the the test beds and see what kind of feedback we get and come up with the best uh, way, way of approaching it. But we do realize that it does kind of split a little bit into how we have offices have their shift duty set up right now. Um, but like Jerry said, this is really the optimal uh, package for getting the best uh, data in there as our common uh, starting point. And, uh, and the benefit we get from having all the offices work at the same time, um, at, at the same point of the forecast, um, we feel outweighs the, uh, some of the negatives there, uh, particularly when it uh, comes to possibly impacting the, the task period there. Okay, uh, thank you. And let's go now to uh, John in Indianapolis. Go ahead, John. This is actually Eric, the ITO, with the question. Oh, when hi, we, Eric. <laughs> when we are performing service backup for another site, I'm just seeking clarification here. What would be the proper way to, to emulate the automatic cron run? Just select the run the procedure forecast builder cron? That'd be correct. Yep, until I, until I get a new. So I get a script uh, written for doing that in backup. Shouldn't be too hard. Just need to <laughs> spend the time for that. <laughs> oh, I, I understand, Andy. I was just wanted to verify that that was the proper way, and, and just uh, they'll just have to remember to do it. Yep. And one thing I, I wanted to sort of mention about service backup is one of the complaints that we've had in the past is we're missing a lot of the models that we generally use in service or in you know non-service backup situations. One of those models or sets of models being the adjusted models. So they're going to now all be available, um, which should help at least what Superblend looks like um, in in the service backup situation. We still won't have the bias correction that that was too hard to get over, but um, at least we'll have the adjusted models now. Okay, Eric, did that answer your question? Yes, it did. Thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. Okay, um, let's see. Anybody else have any questions for our esteemed uh, uh, guest today? Okay. Any other, uh, anything you want to close with? Uh, Andy, Chuck, or Jerry? Well, I, I think I'm just going to close with our, you know, the slide here about, you know, if, again, feel free to contact, you know, ideas, bugs, you name it, we're open. Two-way two -way street here. <laughs> yeah, and just to further emphasize that point, this is, you know, our opportunity as a region and then as, you know, the 10 test bed sites to really impact the way um, gridded forecasts will happen in the future. So don't take this lightly. Use this as an opportunity to help shape and mold how we are all going to be doing gridded forecasting. And this, you know, use our group to try to make this process better and add science. And if you find problems, don't just work around them. Go to us and say, hey, I wasn't able to get this weather element that I wanted in, in the weather grid. Can you help us out? And we will get an update out there for you that will have that, or we'll try to at least. So, And if we can't, we'll pass that on up to the National Blend and Model folks who are also working on this very problem too. So please do work with us to try to help make this a better process. 
I believe we have one question uh, left, actually, uh, from Matt Bunkers, and I'm just trying to get it. Go ahead, Matt. Uh, you're unmuted. Yeah, John, um, or actually, Andy, I thought we were just testing the procedure around the ops area, and after we run the light version, it says to check over foundational grids and so forth, and it says if you change your max or min, don't forget to run the diurnal procedure. What specifically is that referring to, the local diurnal procedure we have, or is there some other part of forecast builder we need to be aware of? That, uh, that diurnal is the, NW, it's the NWS diurnal uh, procedure. It's, uh, it's just called diurnal under the populate menu. Uh, and that uh, and that that was the that was the recommended uh, uh, procedure. You know, that's something too that I could um, you know build into for, forecast builder to call like you know. And we've actually talked about that in the past is that it could you know you could like click an option and it would rerun the max if you wanted to you know the hourly temperatures. Yeah, that's what I thought it was, but I just wanted clarification since this is all a new process and I didn't know if there was supposed to be something that was actually part of the forecast build that uh, actually did that. But thanks for clarifying. Yep, no problem. Very good. Well, we're at 30 minutes and it uh, looks like uh, if we have any other questions or last minute comments, um, speak up now. Hey, John, this is Chuck. Yeah, Chuck, go ahead. I just want to um, also emphasize that the forecast builder, although we've got it set up for periods two through day seven, it can be used uh, for those for the first period and the current period, too. So um, go ahead and experiment with that. Give us feedback on how that works for you, and um, just know that whenever you use it, it will be using the best available data at, at that time that, that it has it. So, um, yeah, we welcome all feedback for all periods throughout the entire uh, forecast process, and ideally we'd like to have this um, – robust enough that it can be used for uh, all your, basically all your, your basic uh, grid editing needs there. So um, we're, we welcome all the feedback you can uh, give us on that. So thanks. Okay. Well, uh, Andy, Chuck, and uh, Jerry, thank you very much for joining us today and for your presentation. And with one week to go, uh, if you have any uh, issues, questions, comments, make sure to contact one of them or go to the Forecast Builder VLAB site, or you may email them at the address on your screen. Well, thanks again, and uh, have a good day. Bye-bye.